Well, good morning, church. It is uh, truly encouraging for each and every one who's come to join us in our worship service this morning. If you'd like to turn your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew 10. We're going to pick up in verse 16, and we're going to continue our study surrounding uh, Jesus sending out his apostles surrounding this theme of outreach. And so before we do that, um, let's approach the Lord in a word of prayer. And so, Father, it is good to be in this place. What a privileged people we are to bear the name Christian, to know Jesus Christ, the one Savior of the world. Uh, we thank you for the great privileges we have being here in, in Dallas, Texas. We thank you for the Word of God. And I pray, Father, that you would give us a hunger and a desire to hear these things that we're going to be reading and discussing this morning. I just pray especially, Father, that you would look down from your throne and that you would uh, extend mercy and strength and grace to this congregation and help us to be uh, the people of God that are pleasing in your sight to be like the church that we read about in Jerusalem. Please give me strength and help me, Father, to proclaim boldly your truth. And we just thank you for Christ and his indescribable grace and the sacrifice that he gave to us on the cross. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So if you would turn to the book of Matthew, we're going to continue in the 10th chapter. We're going to pick up in verse 16. So this is Jesus speaking and he says the following words, behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and child will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone throughout all of the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes." And so the following scriptures set before us uh, this morning deal with the cost of discipleship, and they explain in detail some of the hardships that the followers of Jesus are going to experience in the near future. And so Jesus speaks very plain. There are no surprises for those who follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but, but maybe you've started a job before, and, or maybe you agreed to help out a friend, and you weren't really sure of what was required of you. And, and as you got into that uh, particular agreement, uh, you found out that this wasn't what you signed up for. The followers of Jesus Christ are not permitted to say that because Jesus has made it ever so plain from the very beginning what the price of following in his footsteps would be. And so he is plain and he is clear. And so with Jesus, there's no fine print. He is 
transparent in every way. And so the words of Paul, as he states what we should expect as Christians in Philippians 1, 29 through 30, are true as well. I want to read that for us. Philippians 1, 29 through 30. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And so both of these ideas go together, and we don't always do the best job of putting these two ideas together, both believing, having salvation in Jesus, but also, on the other hand, we are to experience, we have been granted, we have this high privilege of suffering alongside with Jesus as Paul continues engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. And so for the church in Philippi, they saw a suffering apostle. They saw Paul was afflicted by Gentiles and by Jews. And then even to this time when he writes this, he's still being afflicted. And Paul is saying that this is not just the experience of the apostles, but this is to be the experience of the church at large. And surely it applies to us as well. And so Paul goes on in that book to describe further what it is to follow Jesus, what it is to pursue him, and some of the things that we are to expect. In Philippians 3.10, he writes the following. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So not only do we want to try to understand the power that is in Jesus Christ, to understand what it is to live a life in the power of the Holy Spirit, to overcome the flesh and the world and temptation, but also Paul desires to identify with Jesus in his sufferings. And so this should be our desire as well. And as he continues, that by any means possible... I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And so we get the idea from Paul's writings and also in the text this morning that it is a salvation issue, that we are faithful unto death, that we bear up under suffering just like our king who went before us, who gave the perfect example. And one of the things that I think is so difficult as we are studying the apostles as we look at their suffering, is the idea that's put forward in Luke chapter 11, 47. Jesus gives these words to the Jews. He says, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets who your fathers killed. And so the idea that's put forward is we honor the apostles, and we lift them up, and we praise them, And we speak so highly of them, but we forget the persecutions that they had to endure. And this is true of every um, great and godly individual in Scripture, that though we look back at history and we see um, how amazing someone like Moses, someone like David was, but many times we forget that in the time in which they lived, these men were persecuted and they were hated and that is true of the apostles and I think we need to realize um, that if we're going to follow in their footsteps we should be willing um, to fight the good fight and to consider whether we have that fight in us to endure and, and to count the cost of discipleship that has been put before us and so look here in verse 16 back in Matthew 10 Verse 16, Jesus says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. And so what a picture and a rich illustration describing the relationship between the sons of God and those who are in the world. And uh, so we might say that that if you have been born of God, 
That is, if you have become like a sheep, the wolves will not be able to resist you. Wolves will not attack wolves. Persecution, therefore, is a clear sign of genuine conversion. If you have become one of the sheep of Jesus Christ, we should expect to be persecuted. And so this country, uh, like many others, was formed by very dedicated and, and rugged pioneers. And also uh, in the formation of this country, there were many rugged uh, pioneer preachers and missionaries who traveled around to spread the gospel, and we're still benefiting from the great sacrifices that they uh, gave uh, for the furtherance of the gospel. One such individual uh, was traveling from one town to the next, and he realized that he hadn't been persecuted for a while. And so he began to pray and, and ask the Lord, have I denied the faith? What's wrong with the way that I've been um, engaging in my ministry because I haven't been persecuted about that time as he was praying, an angry farmer threw a brick and it grazed the top of his head and he then fell to the ground and rejoiced and praised God for confirming that he was in fact a true child of God. He got back on his horse and he went on to the next town and so we understand that persecution is a sign of true discipleship. And so it is appropriate for us to be concerned if we are not receiving resistance from the world, if the wolves are not attracted to us, if they do not want to devour us, we need to be concerned and ask for confirmation um, of true conversion. And so, if we are persecuted, we are to rejoice along with the great cloud of witnesses and the prophets who went before us, for we've been found worthy of suffering alongside of Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus goes on to give a little bit of wisdom. He, he gives us a proverb to describe how we're to interact with the world. It's one that would have been familiar uh, with those of this time period. Continuing in verse 16, he says, So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And Christians have generally interpreted this proverb uh, to suggest that we are to embody the positive characteristics of both of these creatures. We are to flee from danger when possible like a serpent. And maybe you've been walking in the woods uh, before and, and you've noticed how uh, snakes have the ability to disappear and to flee under cover. And this is a wonderful characteristic that when possible, we're to flee from those who persecute us. And in the same way, it is very clear that we are to be blameless before men. We are to follow all the laws of the government in order that uh, we might be innocent as doves and that the um, government might not bring any kind of accusation against us. And so as we look here in verse 17, we are to beware of men... For they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And I don't know if you notice how strange and, and shocking and interesting this is and, and the irony that we have here that Jesus is saying that his followers are going to be flogged in the very house of God, in the synagogues, this place that is dedicated to uh, to the worship and the reading of the word. And so in this passage here this morning, Jesus is giving a summary. It is a prophetic summary of what we're going to read in the book of Acts, of the different persecutions and the different troubles that his followers are going to face. If we can continue in verse 18, we begin to see um, that picture um, coming true. 
And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. And so, the, in the Scripture, we see that one of the ministries, one of the chief functions of the Holy Spirit is helping men to speak. I think back to that conversation that Moses had with the Lord, in which the Lord reminds him that it was, in fact, God who made his mouth, and the same God that made his mouth is the one that can give him the ability to speak. And this is true of anyone who has ever stood up to testify uh, before men of the greatness of God, all the prophets and all those in the New Testament. And we can also have confidence, too, that God will help us, that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to help us and to give us strength to boldly proclaim the Word of God, He's not about to leave us as orphans, right? He's going to send the Comforter. He's going to send the Holy Spirit who is going to help us. He will not abandon us in the most critical hour. And this is why Paul makes it his practice to both pray himself and to instruct others to pray for utterance. That is, to pray that he might declare the gospel as it should be proclaimed. And so he acknowledges, the scripture acknowledges, the spiritual nature of witnessing for Jesus. It must be delivered with spiritual authority and, and force, and it must be fitting and appropriate for the, for the hour. And and maybe you can think about uh, a time in which um, you were called to, to speak to a friend who was extremely troubled. And as you know that God just gave you the right words and you're amazed at how you were able to think of those things, that is the Holy Spirit at work. And I've been in those situations in uh, some of the most difficult uh, counseling situations where I've been talking to someone that I have no ability. I'm not qualified. I don't understand uh, the types of sorrows and the trouble that they're in, but God is so incredibly faithful. If we are going to step forward, if we're going to put ourselves in that situation, He is going to give us just the right words, and maybe you've been um, the one who's received that. God has sent someone to you at the worst, uh, darkest hour to speak right into your situation, and you're amazed at the power that those words speak to your soul. That is God using men, frail vessels through which he has placed the treasure of the Holy Spirit in order to comfort and to speak those words. And so how encouraging it is as we um, look at these difficult and terrible sufferings and persecutions that we know that God is going to stand behind us and he is going to give us the exact words that we need. And so look in verse 21. Brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And so notice once again, just like Paul pointed out, there is this expectation that even in the most difficult trials, Jesus is expecting his followers, followers to endure to the end. And it is a salvation matter and so we desire that God would give us the ability to continue the course that he has set before us so that by any means possible, we might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Verse 23, when they persecute you 
in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Then verse 24, these are some comforting words. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple to be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? And being falsely insulted is a very difficult thing to endure. This is such a bizarre and odd feeling when you've done absolutely nothing wrong, but people hate you without cause. And maybe some of us are currently uh, living uh, through this, and, and we've definitely experienced this as we follow Christ and the way that the world looks at us. And so in this, we see that our story is just like the pages of the New Testament. As we follow our master, we're going to experience the same things in which he experienced. If Jesus experienced betrayal, we're going to experience Judas's in our life betraying us. If Jesus had fierce conflict with Pharisees, And Sadducees, we, his servants, should expect these very same things, and we shouldn't be surprised. And if there were people that were cheering for his failure and coming up against him, uh, we should also expect those same kinds of encounters. And so Christ, on every turn, encountered difficulty, and so this is our lot if we gather with him. And so as we consider this this idea of a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master, this is incredible. It would make sense for servants to suffer for their king. It it makes sense in our understanding and in the ways of the world for soldiers to die for their country, to die for their king, but how indescribable and how wonderful it is that the king of glory has been the pattern. He has showed us the way, and he has suffered for the servants, and how appropriate is it that we should suffer along with him, and how incredible it is that we have this example. I'll never forget uh, the experience of getting to work uh, for my uncle um, in his uh, fish farming uh, business. One day, uh, I remember we were working. It was a terribly hot day, and we were down in the fish ponds, and we were sorting fish, uh, trying to determine uh, which were male and which were female. And this is a, a extremely difficult um thing to do, and it's almost impossible to determine which are male and which are female, and so we're in our waders, about four feet of of water, and and my uncle drives up in his car, and he's in his nice clothes, and he walks right down into that muddy catfish farm and gets his clothes all wet and begins to instruct us on how to sort these fish, and It's amazing when you see an example from a leader, and that has stuck with me, and how incredible uh, the examples that we see from Jesus Christ. He's gone before us. He's suffered everything, and the least we can do is to follow in his footsteps and to, with joy, suffer along with him. And so, in verse 26, uh, Jesus gives us a summary statement. He's just described some of the worst and most terrifying um, earthly scenarios of of betrayal and, and suffering to which he responds in these words. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered 
that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. And how amazing in the face of these troubles we have these words to have no fear of these things. He says, what I say to you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so he encourages us to be bold, to proclaim from the rooftops the gospel. And also that we are to not fear men, but we are to fear the living God whose job it is to judge. And so Jesus continues to give more comfort to his disciples. In verse 29, he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore you are more valuable than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledge, acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And so as we consider this, how incredible that, that God knows every single hair on our head. God knows every individual in this congregation. He knows every single concern, every single need, and he is here to supply everything that is lacking in our lives. And so as we step back a minute, as we think about this commission, as Jesus is calling his followers to boldly proclaim the gospel in the face of of opposition, I want us uh, to consider some of the excuses that are made. I think one of the, the uh, first excuses that people made make is persecution, right? If I go out and I witness for Jesus, if I tell people, if I speak that name, I'm going to be persecuted. And this is something that keeps them from following him. We have many examples in scripture of, of different excuses. Some say, I've just bought a field. I need to go take care of this field. Or I've, I've just bought some, some oxen and I need to go try them out. I can't come to the banquet. I can't proclaim the gospel. Or I've just gotten married. Or there's, there's these different things. The cares of this world keep us from following Jesus. I want us to consider this famous um, story in Luke 10 the story of the Good Samaritan as we consider excuses that keep us from obeying the words and the commission of Jesus. Luke 10, verse 25. Luke 10, verse 25. I'm actually going to jump down to verse 30. Luke 10, 30. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. And so what a description of what the devil does to people. who stri He strips them, he beats them, spiritually speaking, and he leaves them half dead. How many are just like this individual in this community who have been left half dead by the devil? And so Jesus continues, Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side, so likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. And so many times we're like this priest 
and we're like this Levite. God has given us the charge. He has given His church the sole responsibility of going after these people who have been left half dead by the devil. And He desires that we, like the Samaritan, would have compassion upon them, that we would stop, that we would obey the commission and follow after them. And so many times we give different excuses for why we can't follow after them. And so I am so thankful as I reflect on Scripture that the Apostle Paul, it wasn't, um, he, he wasn't deterred by persecution. Just think about um, all the different things that he endured. Think about what it would have been like to be an early Christian. How grateful would you have been for that great missionary who was stoned, who was beat, who suffered so many different pressures within and without from his own countrymen and from Gentiles. Praise God that Paul was not deterred by persecution and praise the Lord. Praise Jesus Christ who is enthroned and victorious uh, this very moment that he was not deterred from coming to seek and save the lost by a wicked world who severely persecuted him and tortured him uh, to the point of him dying on the cross. And I pray that we would have that same attitude, that we would be stirred with compassion, that we would be moved with love. And so it is love that is willing to do anything. There is absolutely nothing that a father would not do for his son or his daughter. There is no amount of persecution. There is no amount of suffering that could hold a father back from going after his children. And in the same way, we are to have this same love of God within our hearts. There is nothing that is going to deter us from going after those children of God, those lost sheep who are struggling along the way. One more conclusion Suffering produces intimacy with God. The devil means things for our harm, but God can turn those very things around to be the greatest blessings in our lives. I think about our dear brother Eric and, and some of the sufferings that he went through um, recently. And it's so incredible to hear from him how he described that time, the most difficult sufferings, as being some of the greatest blessings that he's um, experienced because it's during those times of affliction and persecution that we draw so incredibly close to the Lord. And so I want us to, to reflect upon uh, excuses and things that keep us and deter us from obeying the simple command of Jesus, from shouting the gospel from the rooftop and taking this great uh, gospel to those who are in need. And I think about um, even the, the, the setting and, and the time in which we live. It's, it's a divided nation. Everybody is, is arguing fiercely with their neighbor. And so many times there's so many different distractions, even in the church, uh, squabbling over little things that are not important. What would you say of the man whose house was on fire but he was so busy arguing with his neighbor that he didn't even notice that his house was on fire. Would it not be appropriate to go up to this man and to shake some sense into him and tell him to stop squabbling about insignificant things and let's put out this fire? And how this is a, an appropriate illustration of the church. So many times we're, dis, we're distracted about things that are not important when the house is on fire. And a more accurate description would be the entire city is on fire and the Lord is desiring for His church to wake up spiritually and to be focused on salvation issues and to be focused on taking the gospel to those who are most desperate. And so in the face of 
of suffering. There is such an encouragement. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. What a promise that is that if we endure, if we are faithful, we will reign with him. What an incredible promise. There's so many other scriptures that speak to that very same thing, and I hope that you've been encouraged uh, this morning. I'm so encouraged by some of the things that are happening in this church. It was encouraging to hear that, that last week uh, there were two people who were baptized who had listened to our radio program, and um, the, the, the man that was baptized went home, and he was going to baptize his, his wife, and so that's uh, three just this past week. That was uh, so encouraging to, to hear that. Um, as we begun last week this, this discussion of, of outreach, I'm so thankful uh, that God sent a, a dear sister here who is passionate about outreach, and he's been sending other people who have such a passion for these things. And so this is the time to get serious. This is the time that our nation needs us more than ever. We need to be seeking God intensely. We need to be seeking revival. We need to be praying, and I hope that this is your passion and this is your desire. Uh, maybe there's uh, someone here this morning who is not a, a, a Christian who, or is listening to this uh, message. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And the command of Jesus Christ is that we are to turn our hearts. We are to repent from following the desires of the world, and we are to be baptized. We are to reenact this death, burial, and resurrection. We are to have our sins washed away. We are to receive the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then we are to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. If this is your desire, I urge and I plead with you to come forward uh, today. If there are any other prayers that we can pray for you as a church, we also desire uh, for you to come forward as we stand and sing our invitational song. from glory how he gave his life on calvary 